Hello, everyone, and thank you all for being here today. We would like to start by thanking the Navy Child and Youth Education Services for making today's webinar on Math Matters possible. So my name is Louise Webb. I was an Army spouse for 23 years, and I am currently enjoying life as a retired spouse. My husband and I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We have two sons, ages 21 and 17. Our oldest is a junior in college at Montana State University, and our youngest is a senior in high school. And I've been a trainer for the Parent to Parent program for nine years. With me presenting today is Katia Pinkston, also with MSEC. Hi, I'm Katia Pinkston. I have been around the military for many years, first as the spouse of an active duty soldier for 30 years and now as a retired spouse. We are currently stationed in Germany, and we have a senior who attends the Dodia High School here. I have been a trainer for the parent-to-parent -parent program for five years. Thanks, Katya. So welcome to our webinar on Math Matters. So before we launch into this topic, let us just take a moment to show you a short video that will tell you a bit about our organization and what we do. And oftentimes we get feedback on audio issues that occur. So if you hear us through your headset, you should be good to go on all audio for voice and video. If you are calling in on your phone, please know that the audio for the video will come through your computer and not your phone. If your system won't let you sign into the audio through your computer, or you cannot hear sound through your headset, it's, more, it's most likely that your internet connection doesn't have enough bandwidth to support the audio through your computer. Your best option to listen to the webinar live right now is to call in using your phone. If you don't have capability to hear all aspects of the presentation now, know that you will receive a link shortly after the webinar that you can access at a later time to listen to the voice and the video audio for the entire presentation. If you have additional concerns or questions, contact us in our chat box and we'll help you work to resolve it. When you think of our country and the patriotic people who sacrificed to defend it, do you think of the children? My mom and my dad are in the Navy. My dad is a soldier. He just left for Afghanistan again. Sarah knows her dad loves her, and they do their best to stay connected. But the truth is, because of the military mission, he's been away almost half of her life. Service members have lives and dreams and families, just like the rest of us. Many are just starting their families. When Courtney first came to my class, I could tell she was carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders. There are now nearly two million children with a parent serving in the military. Most of these kids are school age, and 80% of them attend public schools in the United States. My teacher knew I'd been working with a different textbook at my last school. She said if I came in early, she would help me with my homework. Being a teacher, we like to think that we're very knowledgeable, that we're experts on kids. I was surprised at how much I had to learn, but I'm thankful for MSEC programs. I feel like I'm a much better teacher now. They didn't volunteer for duty, but in their own way, they serve our nation too. A move is traumatic for anyone, but especially for a child who is trying to establish new footings. The Military Child Education Coalition exists to serve and support the children of those who serve and protect us. We were in Guam, and the teachers at the school were so good at helping the kids to be resilient, to feel understood, but more than that, to feel normal. Research using the real life stories of children, moms, and dads shows us that these children experience more stress and challenges than their peers. The opportunity to help is real. We see success stories every day. How does MSEC make a difference? With training for teachers and school administrators, with resources that teach about literacy, coping, adapting, and belonging, and with programs for parents and children to empower them with the confidence and skills they crave so they're ready and able to take advantage of everyday opportunities to learn, to grow, to connect. They let me talk with my dad in a video chat in the school office. It was great to see a smile. MSEC uses evidence-based programs that get results. We create awareness about the needs of military children. My son received a scholarship to attend MSEC's five-day leadership program at the U.S. Military Academy. It was an honor for the whole family. The need is there and the results are real. How can you help? Join us 
and help make everyday differences for children. Start today. Thank you, MSEC. Thank you, MSEC. Military Child Education Coalition, for the sake of the child. So MSEC is a nonprofit organization that promotes partnerships between military installations and their supporting school districts. The MSEC's focus is on transition and other educational issues related to the military connected child. We started offering our parent workshops in 2006. So the purpose of the parent to parent program is to provide parents with resources and information to empower them in their role as an advocate for their children as they negotiate the complex and diverse educational systems found throughout the U.S. and the world. So today, you join more than 200,000 military-connected parents who have participated in these workshops worldwide since the program began. Most of our workshops happen in military communities. They're presented by teams that are made up of individuals with personal experience and professional training on moving, separation, and the reality of change for military children. So who are these trainers? Well, they're military parents who have a wide range of experiences in college and in life. They've moved multiple times and supported their military spouses. They've helped their children transition from one installation to another, change schools on average of nine times before they finish high school, and much more. So in short, they've been there and they've done it. And they've received professional training and research-based resources that they share with you. So I'd like to share a couple of administrative announcements before we go any further. So first, after this webinar, you will be getting an invitation from us to take our online survey about today's webinar. We really would appreciate it if you took just the two or three minutes it will require for you to give us your feedback because we want to know what you think about today's presentation and your thoughts about what you'd like to see in future trainings like this. This is the only way that we have to gauge what you need. And it's also a key method that we have to tell the good folks who fund our program what we are doing, and it lets us know where we need to tweak things so that we can continue offering the very best training opportunities possible for you, the military-connected parents that we serve. So please take a moment when you get that email and tell us how we did. And at the end of the webinar, Kati and I will remain on site so that you can ask us any questions that you may have. We'll unmute the webinar so that you can speak to us directly. I ask that when you are not speaking, that you mute your microphone so we don't experience any noise or feedback from your system. And also, you will see a box in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen where you can ask questions during our webinar. We have Tara Gleason with us today monitoring that chat box so please feel free to utilize this feature. Also after our webinar today, we will be providing you with a PDF file of resources and information relating to today's topic. As you logged in, you should have been able to see that resource on the right hand side of your screen. And also this webinar is being recorded. So today's webinar will focus on how math matters, specifically in your elementary school age child, and what we can do as parents to incorporate math into your child's daily life. So let's take a look at our learning objectives. We will learn what scientific research says about how children learn to do mathematics. We will discuss how we can communicate mathematically. We will strengthen problem solving skills and reasoning abilities in your child. And we will explain activities parents can do with their children at home to improve their mathematical ability. So when you registered for this webinar, you should have received a few discussion questions. And one of them refers to how can we use math terminology at home to help our children? So we will be covering this today, but we would love it if you could share with us any math terminology you can use, you use at home to help your kids become familiar with math language, even at a very young age. So please try to keep a running list of terms that you hear in our presentation today. And if you find you have a suggestion, feel free to share it in that chat box, and then we'll address this topic later in the webinar. 
How many of you cook with your children or go grocery shopping with your kids? Maybe put the groceries away when you get home. Maybe you sort laundry before you wash it or have your child do the laundry as a chore on their own. Guess what? You are already supporting math in your children's lives because all of these activities are avenues to help our children learn math. When children cook, they are learning measurement. The grocery store is a great place to review addition, subtraction, estimation, and even basic calculator skills. And doing laundry introduces them to classification. We know from research that children are more likely to be successful learners of really any subject when we as parents actively support their learning. Nowadays, helping our children to make the effort to learn, appreciate, and master math is more important than ever. Our increasingly technological world demands strong skills in math, not only in the workforce, but also in everyday life. And these demands will only increase over the lifetimes of our children. To ensure that our kids are ready for high school and on track for success in college and the workforce, we must become involved early on. And of course, stay involved over their entire school years to reinforce our children's skills and positive attitude towards math. Although parents can be a positive force in helping children learn math, we can also undermine our children's math ability and attitudes by saying things such as math is hard or I'm not surprised you don't do well in math. I didn't like math either when I was in school. We really can't make our children like math, but we can encourage them to do so and we can take steps to ensure that they appreciate its value in everyday life and in preparing for the future. Learning math is a natural process. Our kids do it every day since the day they were born. Humans are natural problem solvers. That's how we have survived all these millions of years. So teach your child to think of themselves as a mathematician. No pressure, no lecturing, just encourage their natural curiosity and organization. There are three skills we can help develop in our children. Those three skills will strengthen their math skills as they get older and as math gets more involved. So the first skill is problem solving. A problem solver is someone who questions, finds, investigates, explores solutions to problems. The words we're using are important. Use active, positive words when you solve everyday problems. And children love to be called explorers or detectives. So a problem solver is a person who understands that there may be different ways to arrive at an answer. The wrong answer can sometimes be very useful because we can learn from wrong answers. We can learn from mistakes, such as when we discover that we made a mistake when we subtracted numbers, for example. Another way is when we encourage them to use math in everyday situations. We can encourage our kids to be good problem solvers by including them in routine activities that involve math. For example, measuring when we cook something or figuring out costs and comparing prices of things that they really want to buy. Next is communicating mathematically, which basically means that we use math language at home. This involves using words such as subtract, greater than, less than, or equal to, percent, and so on. The more often our kids hear these words, the more familiar and comfortable they will become with the language of math. Also, when we use charts, numbers, or symbols, we can better illustrate 
why we solve something a certain way. Also teach your child to listen so they understand another person's way of reasoning. At the same time, we can also help our children learn to communicate mathematically by asking them to explain what they must do to solve a math problem and ask them, tell me how did you arrive at your answer? Also, have your child draw a picture or diagram to show how she arrived at that answer. Third is learning how to think logically. We can help our children demonstrate reasoning abilities and thinking logically when we show them similarities and differences in objects and problems and then show them how to make choices based on those facts. Being able to do math in your head or mental math is very important. So with your child, start by thinking out loud. Go through the steps to help them learn to think logically. We can also encourage our children's mathematical reasoning ability by talking with them about thought processes and cause and effect relationships. Also, some of you may already be using puzzles at home. Puzzles are a great way for children to hone their problem-solving and logical reasoning skills. Let us now talk about how you can help your child apply those essential math skills. So in first and second grade, children are learning about addition, subtraction, and they are also spending time on greater than and less than. Picturing a problem helps our kids understand the problem and identify a solution. As I just mentioned, one of the most helpful problem-solving strategies is to have the child make a picture or a diagram. Picturing a problem helps children understand the problem easier and it helps them towards finding a solution. Pictures or diagrams can also help prompt our child to keep track of what is needed to solve those more difficult multi-step problems. Another way is to use songs. Songs can help kids remember key math operations, such as the multiplication table or math formulas. Examples of such songs could include rhymes about the fourth multiplication table, for example, or ways to remember how to calculate area and perimeter. So now let's take a moment and watch this fun video about examples of math songs. Across equations that have parentheses in them, we always do what is inside the parentheses first, whatever operation that may be. So, in order to teach kids that you always do the operation inside the parentheses first, I use a chant that says, do this first. So every time they come across an equation with parentheses, they put their hands over their head to represent the parentheses, and they say, do this first. Sometimes, when we come across problems that have area or perimeter, we might get them mixed up. So in order to understand what is area versus perimeter, um, we use a chant that says, area means length times width. Every time they come across a problem that has area in it, we say, area is length times width. That we know that area means length times width, we need to know what perimeter means. When we see the word perimeter, we say we add up all the sides. So every time you see the word perimeter, you say perimeter means add up all the sides. When learning multiplication, we need to learn how to count by multiples of numbers. To learn how to count by multiples of four, you can sing this song. 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24, 
Another multiplication trick is to use your fingers when multiplying by 9. If you wanted the answer to 9 times 2, you would count from left to right, 2, 1, 2. Put that second finger down. Anything to the left of that finger is your tens place. Anything to the right of that finger is your ones place. So 1 10 is 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. 9 times 2 is 18. It works with all 10 fingers. If you wanted 9 times 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, your answer is 54. Let's now talk about milestones. In first and second grade, students are learning addition and subtraction. In third grade, they are focusing on multiplication and division. And then in fifth grade, they're learning more complex math. It's important that children learn to master math facts. And by this, we mean multiplication tables and use of flashcards, for example, as a way to increase math fluency. When we help our kids learn these facts, they will benefit from this throughout their school years and throughout their lives. Some of you may be using math apps at home to reinforce what they are learning in school. Another one of our questions we supplied you with before our webinar today was to ask you if you would like to share which app you are using at home. If you have a suggestion, please type it into the chat box and we will share it with the other participants. Matching focuses on how things are alike and it takes a lot more skill than putting two of the same color socks on every morning. Matching allows us to identify that things are equal. Equal and not equal is a basic math concept that is key to making comparisons. It allows us to take the measure of things and then compare them. It is not only important in math, but it is also so important in reading because matching is the skill that makes it really possible for us to distinguish letters as well as shapes and numbers. Also understanding same and different is an important first step on the way to master the logical thinking skills needed to sort out what fits and then what doesn't fit. When children sort objects by an attribute, and that could be size, shape, or color, they can see math in objects and patterns around them. So to help kids learn how to sort, look around the house or look outside. Ask your child to look out for patterns and that could be anything, such as a row of trees or windows in a building. Or help your child identify objects that are of the same color. Another idea is to use music. Clap or tap a pattern and have your child repeat it. Identify and repeat patterns your child has heard using songs, rhythm instruments, or charts. Some of you may know the Simon Says game. So the Simon Says electronic game is also really a fun way to learn patterns and repeat rhythm through music. In your resources, we are including an activity that contains four different levels of pattern and matching skills. And it's kind of difficult to explain all this through a webinar. But we, it will really be a great hands-on activity that you can use with your child at home. So let's move into geometry. So geometry at the elementary level involves more than just knowing the names of the shapes. It's tied to other topics in math, like measurement and numbers. Geometry is closely linked to other mathematical concepts, like finding perimeter or area, fractions, data, and algebra. 
In order to be successful in these areas, children in the lower elementary grades need opportunities to explore geometry and get geometry help. So children need to be able to describe shapes using the correct name and description. So pointing out shapes in our everyday lives can help our kids get a better grasp of geometry. So for example, maybe while you're waiting at the doctor's office for a doctor's appointment, take a look around the waiting room to see how many shapes that you see. When you're driving on roads and highways, this offers lots of opportunities to see various street signs and shapes. And making a game out of identifying shapes helps build a foundation in geometry. So children learn to identify the attributes of measurements, which includes learning about size, weight, length, volume, and using these to make comparisons. So the essence of measuring and comparing is sizing things up in relationship to something else. So words themselves don't mean much until children understand the concept of what that word represents. So it's a good idea to give children hands-on experience to develop the concepts of measuring and comparing. So for example, you can estimate the width and the length of an object in your home and then actually measure the object to see how close or how far you came. And this can also be done with estimating volume, like guessing how many cups of milk really are in a gallon, and then truly measure and see how close or far you come. Another one of our questions we supplied you with before the webinar today was about of ideas how to help kids learn measurements. So if you have any other fun and creative math measurement ideas that you'd like to share, please type those in the chat box as well, and we'll share your ideas with our audience. Also, check out our PDF file that we provided for you today for today's webinar, because there's lots more examples of how to learn measurement with your children. So collecting data or information to evaluate is key in finding out the answer to a question. We mentioned earlier that we can help children recognize data by sorting objects according to one or more attribute, like a color, their shape, their texture. So when we sort and classify, we focus on what is different. So in other words, we are analyzing our data. And when we help kids think in categories and classify objects, we lay the foundation for mastering mathematical skills. So there are a variety of levels of classification. So the simplest classification is sorting like versus unlike items. So an example of this is picking the socks out of the laundry. We've mentioned this already. But the next level of classica classification is sorting the items into groups according to attributes. So an example of this type of classification is sorting vegetables into piles based on kind. And the next level of classification is sorting that same group of things a number of times in a, in a variety of ways, which will encourage children to think creatively. So taking that same group of vegetables, you could then sort them by color or you could sort them by shape to get the different classifications. And once you've collected some data, you can help your child organize or present it in different ways. And you do this by using tally mark graphs or line plot graphs, bar graphs, and even pie charts. And lastly, we're going to take a look at probability. So probability is defined as the likelihood of an event happening. A fun way to learn probability is to use it, do it by experiment. And an easy example is tossing a coin. So you have a one in two chance of getting heads or tails. So the probability of getting either is 50% or one half. Another example to use with children is tossing a dice. So when you throw a die, a single die, have them guess how many possible outcomes there are. So six is the answer that you're looking for. And you can also, also ask, what's the probability of getting an even number or an odd number? And of course, we'd want them to realize the probability is one third. So again, check out our PDF resource for other fun games to play with your child regarding, regarding probability. So now let's look at some practical ideas of how to use math in our everyday lives. Almost every time you and your child cook or bake, you need to measure. Measuring teaches your child how to make comparisons and estimations as well as to explore the relationship of parts to wholes. 
your child is also counting and adding as he puts the correct number of tablespoons or cups into a mixture. There are, these are all essential skills that will be useful in learning the more complex math skills needed later in school for geometry and algebra. And when measuring ingredients, you can have your child explore, like I mentioned earlier, like how many cups are in a gallon or how many quarts are in a gallon or how many little teaspoons are equal to one big tablespoon. So just a little sidebar, you might want to make sure you have extra flour and salt available for their little mathematical explorations. And some ideas of cooking and baking, make sure you have all the ingredients ready and the utensils ready. Some ideas you can do are using um, your measuring ingredients when you're pouring your liquids, uh, counting how many times they need to stir. I know for brownies, they always say like 50 strokes. That's a great thing for littler ones to be able to count. Um, counting in halves or fours and cracking eggs. These last two I mentioned help teaching fractions. And also, if you're making a pizza, kids can make a pattern on their pizza with their toppings. And then as you're cutting the pizza in the fourths or eighths, you can also incorporate fractions in that activity as well. Another tool you can use is teaching time with temperature. So for, ans for instance, if you have to set the timer for eight minutes for the cookie batch, if the cookies have to bake for eight minutes, you ask your child, what time will it be when the cookies are done? So the purpose of this is to get our kids thinking about math, but really it's without them even realizing that they're doing it. That's the fun part. And did you know that setting the table is actually mathematical? The process of matching a plate, a bowl, a spoon to a placemat is actually a math skill called one-to-one -one correspondence. So this teaches our kids about equal numbers. So you can ask your child, how many forks do we need so that everyone in the family has one? Or if four people are eating, how many plates do we need? But you can um, emphasize this more with multiplication tables the older your kids are. So you can teach addition and multiplication by having them have one fork, one knife, one spoon that equals three utensils, but how many do we need? For example, we have five people in our family, so you can see where that's going. So just tailor your questions based on your child's age and grade and level of ability. Again, the purpose is to get them thinking of math and it's kind of an outside of the box thing and they don't even realize that that's what they're doing. So let's take a look at this short video on cooking with your kids. Math, it's everywhere, even in the kitchen. When you think about it, a recipe is just a big math equation. The Military Child Education Coalition invites you to take advantage of this fun and educational time with your kids, even with a recipe as simple as making hummus. Let's take a look. It all starts with the ingredients. In a recipe, ingredients are identified by measurements that are, in many cases, fractions. Show your kids all of the different measuring devices that you may use in a recipe. This is a great way to demonstrate how fractions are used. In math class, students learn that one half plus another half equals one, and these simple relationships are easy to show in the kitchen. Use your imagination. By reading through the recipe together and letting your kids help you complete the measurements, you are reinforcing basic math concepts like fractions and science concepts like weights and measures. Cooking also offers the opportunity to talk about things like a healthy diet and offers time together that can be hard to find. The Military Child Education Coalition also recommends that you spend time reviewing healthy eating websites like www.choosemyplate.gov with your kids. This activity, combined with the time you spend together in the kitchen, will reinforce the value of a healthy diet and help your kids understand the importance of math in everyday activities. For more information, please visit www.militarychild.org for the sake of the child. Let's look at the chat box. First of all, thank you so much for sharing your ideas. We asked you if you have any other creative math measurement ideas you would like to share, and Tara has been forwarding your ideas to the audience, uh, such as using um, 
measurement tape and if you have not looked at a chat box there are some great ideas there some of the things that you can do um, like using place mats that show counting and um, we had somebody suggest uh, going into the bathtub or using containers in the bathtub so again thank you for sharing that also earlier we suggested you keep a running list of math terms you hear in our presentation today and by now you have probably put down lots of math words such as matching sorting um, weighing symbols greater than less than again we have put it all together in a list and please take a look at the chat box where you will find a list of most of the math terms that we have used today. These are just really some ideas that we can use to help our kids learn about math at home. And at this point, please take a moment to review our slide regarding important math points that we talked about today. One very important point that we want to address is that as parents, we need to be aware of how our children are being taught math in school. Because we really don't want to teach strategies and shortcuts that are going to conflict with the approach that the teacher is using in school. So it's really a good idea to check in with the teacher and ask what you can do to help. Another good idea is to ask the teacher about online resources that you can use with your child at home. Here are a few great websites that can help with math, regardless of your child's age. Kindergartners, really through high school and beyond, can benefit from these two websites. And the first one is khanacademy.org and tutor.com. Very important to remember, tutor.com is free to active duty military. So please be sure to check that out as well. We also asked you to share with us any math apps that you would like to, that you are using at home and that you would like to share with others. So please look at the chat box and you will find lots of apps, website list there, it's a really a long list. Um, just going to name a couple of those, like Math Fact Cafe or um, Hungry Fish for iPhone, Sesame Street Online. So there are really a lot of websites and apps listed there. And we hope that there are some apps listed there that you would like to check out for yourself. We really appreciate all of your suggestions. Again, thank you so much for sharing those with us. We would like to thank you all for joining this webinar today, and we appreciate your participation and thoughtful questions. Following the presentation, you will receive an invitation to take a short participant survey that we mentioned in the introduction. We use this tool to make ongoing improvements to our webinar series add new topics of interest, and provide feedback to our funders. Please take the two to three minutes necessary to complete the survey. If you missed one of our previous webinars, or especially if you would like to share this session with your friend or with your student, the recordings can be found on our website, www.militarychild.org. We would also like to invite you to take part in our many online professional development institute opportunities. Check out militarychild.org for more information and please friend us on Facebook and follow MSEC on Twitter. If you are interested in getting a certificate of completion and additional CEU credits, please complete our online survey. After that, complete the short topical quiz. It only has five questions 
and you will need a passing score of 80%. You will get a link to the quiz after you complete the survey. Then please follow the instructions to receive your certificate of completion. CEUs may be purchased through the MSEC registrar following the successful completion of the topical quiz up to one year from the date of certificate of completion is awarded. All certificates of completion must be validated by the MSEC registrar before CEUs may be awarded. And CEUs for our MSEC parent webinars are awarded through the International Association of Continuing Education and Training. Certificates of completion and CEUs are only available for webinars presented on or after today, February 8, 2017. And if you would like to receive a webinar survey for a pre-recorded webinar presented after today, please contact Brittany Campus at militarychild.org. We would like to give a very special thanks to the Navy Child and Youth Education Services again for making today's webinars possible. And now we are going to unmute our webinar. So you can ask us any questions or discuss any topics with us live. Please. The conference has been your unmuted. Own microphone if you don't wish to comment so that we don't get too much feedback from your system. Does anybody have any comments or questions? Yes, um, I would like to ask um, what you can do when your children get very set on solving certain problems the way the way that they are taught in school and are not open, for example, to looking at the fact that there's different ways to solve problems, not just the very one that they've learned in school. I'll go ahead and take that. Uh, my, my name's Tara, and I'm also a certified school teacher. And I will tell you that for military children, the number one issue that we hear and we see over and over as educators and as parents is math. Math is going to be um, the biggest headache I think you will see as you move your child from place to place. So um, how old is your child? Just curious. Second grade second grade. So I think at that age, um, and that is, I'm very familiar with that age group. That's, that's my primary, first through third is my primary um, area that I teach. I think they have that static, that thought process of this way and no other way. And um, I think it's okay to show him or her that there's another way to do things. And he will absolutely have other ways of finding the same solution and different terminologies as you move from place to place. For him or her, I would be aware that that is going to be a big frustration for him. And it's also something that you're going to want to give a heads up to the teacher that, hey, he's got this thought process and that there's only one way to do it. So I would say continue to be patient with him. I think it's okay to let him know there is other ways to solve the problem. But again, I would encourage you to try to stay consistent with the teacher. And a good math teacher or a good elementary teacher understands there's different ways. And I've been talking with teachers in schools here, and they have said also that, you know, we have a certain curriculum. I live in the state of Illinois right now, and they're going off the Common Core curriculum showing, you know, certain ways to teach certain concepts. But teachers in classes are telling me that they are still showing students other ways to do it and also telling them it's okay to do it that way. And depending on the standardized test that, that your student will most likely take in third grade, um, that varies from state to state. So that's going to be a challenge. So if you, another thing to think about is if you go next year and you know you have a good math student and all of a sudden you see, oh, oh man, their scores in math are not where I think they should be, it could be because they're using a different methodology in the state that you're in next year. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm just, um, I have actually four children and they're all older than my second grade daughter. 
and they yes. never had an issue. I don't know if it's because they're boys, they kind of just cruise through mass, but she's very, um, you know, she would like to just do it that one way, and so it, it, it just narrows the horizon of showing her things at home when she's struggling with the way that they've been taught at school because she's not accepting that there would be another way. Um, and I, and think I don't with know if she's age... holding on to what she's being taught because, you know, we have been in three schools so far. Um, and I'm trying to be patient, and I'm working with a teacher. I was just wondering if you had any ideas on how to kind of, you know, gently tell them that there isn't just that one specific way. And I think it comes with age and maturity. It's developmental also. Developmentally in second grade, they don't have that out-of-the-box thinking all the time. Some students yeah. do, many students do not. So I think developmentally over time, that will come with age and maturity. So I wouldn't get overly concerned at this point. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, if no okay. one has any further questions, we will go ahead and close out our webinar for today. We really appreciate you all taking your time to be with us. And again, as Katya said, we appreciate all your suggestions in the chat box. And um, thank you again. Thanks and goodbye.